Thanks for joining the webcast. I'm Johnny Steele from the Payoneer team. Everyone is talking about GDPR, but what is it? Who does it apply to? How will it impact on my business? We wanted to shed some light on these questions and share what we at Payoneer have done in order to be ready for it. For that, we brought along a leading expert to share his thoughts. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Andrew Dyson, partner at leading global law firm DLA Piper. Andrew, it's over to you. Thank you, Johnny, um, and welcome to this webinar, which I'm going to be running through with you over the next 30 minutes. My name is Andrew Dyson. I'm a partner at DLA Piper, and I lead our data protection uh, practice in the United Kingdom. Um, the general data protection regulation actually comes into force on the 25th of May. So for those of you who are sort of early risers and listening to this webinar right now, uh, as we first publish it, it's, it's, it's in about a week's time. Uh, so this is all very timely. So what we're going to do over the next uh, 30 minutes or so is just give a little bit of a brief introduction to the GDPR. So give a little bit of context to why we have it and what it's all about. Um, and that would really help then explain to you in a little bit more detail what specifically uh, the GDPR is, is uh, requiring organizations to do uh, and the rationale for that. Uh, and we'll look both at the kind of specific legal requirements that come out of the regulation, but also as we go, the practical implications that it means for many businesses. Um, and we'll try to do this in a very uh, clear and simple way, but uh, I have to say this is probably one of the most complicated pieces of European regulation that's ever come out. So, uh, you know, forgive me in advance if there are some technical terms that we have to talk about. So just a little bit of background, really. So the, the GDPR, as I say, it comes into force on the 25th of May 2018, uh, and it's been actually quite long in the tooth. Um, we've had data protection laws in, in Europe for many, many years, I think since the early 1980s. Uh, and the current set of rules that we have originates from around 1995, uh, where there was a directive which the European Commission uh, came up with. Um, and that was implemented across a number of well, all the member states of, of Europe in around between 1998 and 2000. So the current regime, if you like, that we've got for managing the protection of personal data in Europe originates from that period. Now, of course, what's happened is uh, things have moved on quite considerably in the digital world since 1995. Uh, so if you kind of roll back 20 years you know the the environment we were in then was one where we were very much at the dawn of the internet i think most people didn't know what the internet was and the world wide web and things we were talking about there was certainly no um, concepts such as social media um, facebook twitter none of these existed at that point in time email was just coming through the door um, and big data profiling artificial intelligence uh, mobile phones, you know, none of these smartphones, at least none of these things were really in existence or even sort of glimmer in the eye of many of the inventors who were involved in producing these. So uh, the reason I kind of stress that is because all of those technologies that now exist and really we feel we can't live without um, have involved the a transformation really of the both the volume of personal data that is collected and used around the world, but also the way in which that information is used and used to make decisions about us, whether positively, um, when we are trying to kind of do things more efficiently and quicker as we go about our busy daily lives, or, or actually in, in ways which people may be concerned about. Uh, and it's really that area of concern which is driving uh, the, the, the change in regulatory landscape that we're going to be talking about, because uh, really what the, the, the legislators in Europe have been concerned about is with this huge volume of data that's now collected about uh, all of us uh, on, on a daily basis, and the way in which it can be used and has been used by some organizations in, in ways that people don't find um, are appropriate and potentially do undermine uh, the sense of trust and confidence in the way that we go about our daily lives, um, that there is a need to regulate that. And there's a, need, there's a very good reason to regulate that. One, because if it's not regulated, then people may lose confidence in the whole infrastructure that is the internet and, and the digital landscape. And that will lead ultimately to a breakdown of trust and, and a breakdown of trust leads to a breakdown of effectively people interacting with uh, technology. And that uh, actually is a bad thing because it means that digital, all the benefits of digital start to start falling away and we sort of go backwards rather than forwards because people feel they can't interact with the digital environment. Uh, and in Europe, that is seen as, as, as problematic because we want to create, um, a, you know, a, 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 be seen as a, as a leading uh, digital marketplace. So we can't have an environment where people don't want to interact with that. Um, but I think there's also a sense that the current rules are sort of slightly out of date in the sense that, um, you know, they were created a different era. The challenges that we all now see with data were ones that we couldn't really foresee then. So, for example, the way in which data is freely flowing around the world was, was, was you know, happens all the time now with cloud environments and 
and the way that the internet operates, but it was it was a, ver- a rarity in the days of mainframe computers and uh, and, and sort of fixed line connections. Um, we've also got concerns around uh, the way people have kind of access and control over their data. In you know, in 20 years ago, there was a sense that actually not that much data was held about us, and we probably knew where it sits. Well, we don't really know that now. So there's a sense that actually people need to have a gr- much greater understanding of the data that is there about them and who has it and what can be done with it. And actually, if we're not happy with it, the, the idea that we could ask for it to be removed or, or moved from one environment to another to give us much more control over the data. And if you take those kind of principles, which have kind of fed themselves into the sort of philosophical landscape, you, you'll see why uh, the GDPR is here, but also you see what it actually focuses in on. So when we start to look at the actual provisions of the GDPR, you'll see that they actually fits under a number of kind of key criteria here. So some of it is about harmonization. So it's really about trying to create a single standard approach to compliance across Europe, because at the moment we have a bit of a devolved structure under the regulation. So you've got every member state has its own set of rules. So that's seen as a barrier to entry for, for, for digital trade. So some of the rules are, are really here to, to try to make it easier for business to work across boundaries in Europe when they're talking about data. But actually, a lot of it's really about uh, taking uh, organizational accountability for the way in which data, personal data is collected, used, shared, stored, and saying, look, we as an organization, you know, we, if someone's going to be taking information about an individual, they need to be accountable for it. They need to understand what data they're collecting. They need to understand what they're doing with it. They need to know that there's a good reason for keeping it and using it and sharing it in the way that they're going to be doing that. And they're prepared to stand behind that and stand behind that both in front of a regulator, but also to the individual. So to be able to go out actively and say to the individuals whose data you've got, this is the information I have, this is why I'm using it and what I'm using it for. And I'm not shy about that. So that's kind of a key driver. Um, behind a number of the changes we're going to talk about. Um, the flip side of that is control, and I've alluded to this before, this idea that people whose data is taken <laughs> and, and collected and used uh, should have a better sense of control over that data. So the regulation creates individual rights that allow people to have much more uh, easy access to their data, to manage their data, to object to certain types of processing activity if they feel that it's not appropriate, um, and, and really be more, you know, the balance effectively swinging away from the company that takes the data and back to the individual who effectively has given it and, and giving them an opportunity to, um, in some areas, to, to, to manage and control that. Um, we'll also see uh, that there are clear guidelines, uh, much clearer guidelines, if you like, around actually some of the key principles that we've always had in data protection or around uh, you know, notice to individuals about what's happening with their data, fair use of the data, consent, um, to, to the extent that consent is relied on to capture the data, uh, retention of the data, security of the data, some key principles around how data should be collected and used. Um, the GDPR, again, reiterates these principles, but actually uh, provides more granularity and more clarity around the edges, um, which uh, can be quite important when we look at the specifics of that. Um, and then finally, and this is probably the area which has captured the most attention, we've got these concepts of uh, data breach reporting, which now start to find themselves in EU law for the first time. So whilst in the US it's been very well um, a tread and path to be reporting data breaches where they where they arise on a mandatory basis uh, to, to individuals. That's not necessarily been the case in Europe. Uh, it's more been voluntary and it's been a bit of a quilt, quilt patch quilt of, of activity around different countries. So the, the GDPR says actually if, if you suffer a data breach, then you must notify the regulators, uh, in fact, within 72 hours, and also in some cases notify the individuals as well. And of course, what will that do? Well, that will then lead to uh, you know more uh, complaints, it will lead to more investigations. So we've also got in tandem with this an environment where uh, individuals are given greater powers to uh, raise concerns with regulators to actually take uh, direct enforcement action through third um, class action lawsuits potentially, but also the regulators themselves uh, having uh, really quite significant powers to uh, come in, uh, understand what's happened where there's been a data breach, ask questions, but actually also take uh, enforcement that could lead to to fines and fines which can be potentially very significant. So uh, the regime for fines that's provided for under the GDPR allows for uh, those to be set it up to 4% of global turnover of a business. So very significant and, and really on the same level as, as antitrust or competition law. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just canter a little bit through um, some of the kind of key principles behind the GDPR and then delve a little bit more into detail around some of the kind of areas I've touched on
uh, in the previous slide. So first of all, kind of the key principle, sorry, the key concepts. Um, I, I've kind of alluded to this already, but the data protection laws in Europe and, and the GDPR apply to what's called processing of personal data. So any organization which is involved in processing personal data uh, will be regulated uh, in the way that they go about uh, looking, you know, processing that information. Um, and there are separate rules that apply for what we call controllers as distinct from processors. So a controller is someone who ultimately is responsible for deciding how data is collected, used, shared, stored, whereas a processor is someone who's basically been engaged by a, a controller to help them in those tasks. So a typical example might be a payroll provider who might be um, engaged by uh, a company to run a payroll at the end of each month, um, or a cloud vendor who's hosting um, the, the SaaS, SaaS-based service, again, for the controller. So the controller decides what data to collect, it decides what to do with the data, it decides to appoint the agent to help it manage its business. Um, it's primarily responsible for compliance, um, but to the extent it works with processors, they have uh, a, a degree of responsibility too. Uh, and also from a territorial perspective, whilst most of the um, the scope of this is relating to businesses who are located in Europe and processing data in the context of what they do in Europe. It does have an extraterritorial effect. So if um, a controller or indeed a processor is based outside Europe, but uh, involved in processing data that relates to customers who are effectively hot leads of a European uh, activity. Um, so if either the controller is targeting customers in Europe or the processor is um, operating offshore, but, but but the data it's processing relates to um, European customers that another client of its has procured, then they're also going to be subject to the regime as well. Um, and obviously that creates some uh, challenges when we talk about overseas enforcement. Um, but just a quick note on concepts like processing and personal data. So processing is a very broad ranging set of activities. It really includes everything that you can imagine might be happening with data, whether it's collecting it, using it, sharing it, storing it, even just having information in a CPU for a, a millisecond as it's um, as information is shared on a screen as someone maybe looks at a piece of data in, in one environment that's 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 hosted somewhere else. Um, so I think it needs to be in turn, un, understood to be very broad. Uh, whereas personal data is also um, a very broad concept. It's certainly not the same as PII data, which is that common concept in the US. Um, it's it's more than data which on the face of it clearly relates to an individual. It also involves information that, um, that, 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 that might not name a person directly, but it clearly relates back to them. So, for example, an IP address, which is being used to help to track a, a device, which ultimately leads back to an individual or a telephone number or an email address, which might have an alias on it or, or even a photograph or a CCTV image. You know, all of these things. And it's not necessarily obvious that it relates to an individual, but ultimately, if the reason why you're holding that information is that you want to use it in some way, or it can be used in some way to make a decision about someone uh, or, 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 or create some understanding of their activities, then it will be in scope. So that's an important thing to understand because often people look at information, oh, that's not personal data because it doesn't name somebody or it's not there, uh, you know, I, I clearly identifiable. That, that isn't the right test. Uh, the only situation really where data that you hold is not going to be regarded as personal data is where it's been completely anonymized so that there's no way of tracing it back to the original uh, individual. So we'll just move on. Um, I'm now going to go through a couple of the kind of core principles um, and, and the requirements here. So the first one is accountability and governance. As I touched on before, right at the heart of what the GDPR is trying to do, and I think this is a real change from the current regulatory environment, is we're trying to say um, an organization if it's going to be processing personal data, needs to be really accountable for what it is doing with that data. And that means uh, understanding the data. So it means understanding what if flows of information are coming in and out of the organization and how they're being um, handled. But uh, it, And then it's also putting in controls around that. So it's having policies and procedures which say within this organization, we have this set of controls, policies and procedures that mean that we are going to address the requirements of the GDPR uh, in a very clear and coherent way. Uh, and, and adopt those principles in everything that we do. And this isn't just about having a few pieces of paper that says, oh, we as a company have got a privacy policy and we've got a security policy and we've got a subject access policy, uh, retention policy. You know, those are all very good documents to have and will be at the heart of this. It's actually about making sure that those policies are aligned to the way the business operates, that they're underpinned by operating procedures and the way that people implement those policies and ultimately supported by training, guidance, um, 
potential handholding by data protection teams, um, a real understanding across anyone within the organization, whether they are working in the accounts department, the HR team, um, the customer care center, uh, all of these, anyone in the, any part of the organization who potentially is data needs to be in a position where they can handle that uh, in a way which is consistent with these principles. So uh, what, what do we find that those policies cover? Well, they should cover very clearly principles that the data should only be used for lawful purposes, uh, that they should be kept accurate, that they should be only retained for as long as necessary, and obviously dealing with things like security, access control, and so on. So many of these policies you should already have within the organization, but the key behind GDPR is making sure that they are pulled together in a very coherent way uh, and adapted effectively across the organization in the way that the business operates. And that, that is often the hardest part of GDPR is actually turning these policies and procedures into real cultural change for the way that the organization does business. And we'll come back to talk a bit about that at the end of the session. Um, but as I say, to support that, there's an expectation that there's potentially a data protection team in place. And in some com companies, depending on the sensitivity and the volume of data, a data protection officer, which is a very formal appointed role. So they are charged effectively with really being a, uh, a, an accountable officer for the way that data compliance is, is managed within the business and, and making sure that the business is aware of its responsibilities and encouraging them to do the right thing, but also providing a guiding hand and force to deal with questions and queries, helping with data privacy assessments, so risk assessments that should be undertaken routinely for high-risk activities, um, so projects where you might be doing something particularly innovative or complex with data where there might be higher levels of risk, and as I say, supporting with training, guidance, uh, and so on. Um, and really, at the heart of all of that um, is something called a record, so a record of data processing. And this, again, is a new requirement under GDPR. It says the organization must have a written record um, and this can be a spreadsheet or it could be an online tool that actually articulates um, very clearly what activities the business is doing across all the different stakeholder communities with personal data. So that you've got a clear understanding of in the HR department, these are the 15 or 20 different processing activities that we're doing with personal data, setting out why we're doing what we're doing, why we're doing it, what the lawful basis is going to be um, and the retention arrangements. And if we're sharing that data, who we're sharing it with. Um, 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 and if it's going offshore, when is it going offshore and how and why? So really setting out a very granular level um, what is happening with data across the organization. And, and that ultimately is your best record, if you like, or golden record, somebody often says, of being able to demonstrate both internally, but also to regulators that you know what is happening with the data in the organization. And, and that is a really critical document to, to generate um, and at the heart of the ability to demonstrate accountability and governance. Um, the, 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 that golden record has also got one other uh, really important task, and that is to be able to help to create that external facing message that needs to go to uh, the data subjects or the individuals whose data you collect, whether it's your customers, or your staff, your suppliers, to help them understand uh, what data you're collecting about them and, and also what you're doing with it. Um, so uh, you have this obligation to be very transparent to people and you have an obligation to present information in that format um, at the point that you first interact with individuals to tell them who you are, what you're doing with the data, what's the basis for keeping the data and how they um, and how they can act, you know, contact you to find out more. But also, um, you know, they, they're going to have these new rights that I mentioned before, but telling them what those rights are and how they can adopt them. So um, this then leads you down this track of creating privacy notices or fair processing statements. Um, but at the heart of the ability to do that is that data mapping work, because if you don't know what data you've got and you don't have a clear understanding as to the lawful basis on which you're using it, you're not going to be in a position to provide that transparency to the individual. So um, th these two things go very much hand in glove with each other. But you will see, uh, especially anyone who's been in Europe recently, you will see that, uh, you know, many, many businesses are going out, uh, refreshing their privacy notices, going out to customers and telling them that, look, we've got this new uh, GDPR ready privacy statement. And you can click here to have a look at it. Uh, and the reason they're doing that is to comply with this transparency requirement to be much clearer to people about all those things about what they're doing with data, but also importantly, those new rights that people have and how they can be enforced. Um, another aspect of uh, the, the rules is, is dealing with data transfers. So this is situations where uh, the organization wishes to share personal data with another organization or uh, engage a data processor. So I mentioned that at the outset that you might have uh, a department that's working with a third party to 
help manage its systems or processes. It might be a cloud vendor. It might be an outsourced service provider. Um, it might just be an agent helping them on a day-to-day -day basis in, in their service-related activities. You know, in any of those kind of scenarios where data that's sitting in um, you know, the organization's kind of domain is potentially being accessed or used or shared with another organization on the basis that they're just helping to run the business, they're going to be acting as a process of that third party. And the GDPR says there has to be a contract in place with that organization, that third party, and that contract has to have certain minimum contra controls within it. Um, and some of those controls are quite prescribed in terms of being clear that people must, that the third party must only use data in accordance with instructions, must adopt appropriate security measures, must regulate the use of subcontractors so they're only as approved by the, the controller. Um, but it also goes beyond that and says that the, uh, the, the contract must specify, uh, ideally in a reasonable amount of detail, but although this is not always the case, uh, the, the specific nature of the data which is being made available to that third party and the specific scope of the instructions for which they're processing that, that data. So that there's a real clarity of understanding between the controller and the processor about what data is being handed across or made available and what can and can't be done with it. And everyone's agreed on that. And again, you can see how there's a theme here because this is again about accountability. It's about saying if we're going to make information available to a third party, we, we should actually be quite clear to that third party about what we want them to do with it, what they can and can't do with it, rather than just having a piece of paper and say everything's sorted. So that's an activity uh, which any of you who have vendors or are vendors in Europe will be aware of where you know, we're seeing lots of organizations uh, now going through a remediation process of looking through the supply chain and identifying all of their processes and putting in place uh, data protection addendas or variation agreements that actually spell this all out. And, that, and that's an important task to do to, again, comply with the requirement here, but also uh, to, to, to go through that thinking of, well, who am I sharing data with and what is the base on which it's happening? Um, to the extent that any of those activities uh, involve data being shared from Europe to a third country, by which I mean a country outside of Europe, uh, then as we have in the current data protection regime, there are restrictions and constraints on that, and there's an expectation that data doesn't go outside Europe unless further controls are applied. And those uh, further controls mean that you've got to make sure that the country where the data is going to is either what we call a whitelisted country, like Israel or New Zealand or Argentina or Canada, so there's sort of recognized equivalent levels of protection by the EC. Or if it's to another country outside that, like India or the Philippines or the US, that uh, another uh, protective measure is in place to manage the data. And often we see model contract clauses being adopted here or in the US companies adopting Privacy Shield compliance. Uh, but I, you know, it, it's beyond today to kind of go into the realms of that. But the, the important task to, to take away from here is uh, being aware where there are third party uh, transfer situations going on, that you have a contract in place that it addresses those requirements in the GDPR. And additionally, if there is uh, a transfer happening outside of Europe or those whitelisted countries, uh, that that is also properly managed. Uh, so you'll see a lot of activity around that space uh, for those reasons. Um, and tied into that is a, a wider concept of uh, security, confidentiality, data breach management. So there are broad ranging obligations to maintain appropriate levels of protection around the processing of personal data. People often ask me, what does that mean? Are there specific standards? Are there specific requirements? And the answer to that is no. It's a, the, the test is what is appropriate, which effectively means you as a controller or where you're a processor as a processor have to be satisfied that the levels of protection that you're putting in place um, are proportionate and commensurate with the risk of the data that you are looking after and processing. So um, holding a small number of uh, emails and, and not expected to have the same level of um, uh, security controls and protections in place as, uh, as a database of uh, health related information for you know a population of a million people. Um, so it's about being commensurate in the controls and protections and recognizing that as risks evolve, the levels of protection will change as well. So uh, the security risks uh, will, will be uh, dictated to by also the environment in which we're all working, which changes from time to time. So the key thing is making sure that that is all well understood, uh, that if you are a controller or a processor, you understand what security as a minimum you're applying and that it's appropriate. You're doing checks on that. You're looking at a whole range of issues, not just the technical security measures, but also the organizational ones. So um, physical issues, issues around protecting the confidentiality of information where you've got staff, uh, 
coming in and potentially accessing systems, so access controls, um, but also disaster recovery and backup systems. So if there is a breach scenario that you've got an ability to carry on doing business and, and have that resilience in as well. So it's a very broad ranging concept. Um, and if, of course, you do suffer a personal data breach, by which mean a breach of information which affects either the integrity, the confidentiality or the availability of personal data, then that is something which has to be reported um, almost immediately to the, the, the relevant local uh, regulator or supervisory authority. Uh, and in any event, that has to be done within 72 hours. Now, there's a lot of kind of people asking, well, well what do we mean by 72 hours? When does the clock start? When does it stop? Um, who is my supervisory authority? These are all good questions, and there's quite a lot of guidance on this. Um, but the, the takeaway is, if there's a breach, you need to be able to quickly uh, escalate it, review it, assess it, see whether it complies, you know, whether it falls inside the threshold of uh, of what we call a personal data breach, which may be reportable, uh, and then uh, notify the regulators. Uh, and there's some good guidance on that, but it's it's still evolving in many areas. And, and then separately, as it says here as well, if uh, the data breach is likely to result in what is called a high risk to an individual, by which we, I think, mean uh, there's a real likelihood of harm to be caused to them, uh, like financial loss, then you should be notifying them too. Um, so this all dictates the need to make sure that we've got very clear and um, uh, well, uh, well, well structured and well tested breach management protocols, uh, and uh, our staff are trained on how to note, you know, how to spot a breach scenario, how to escalate it internally, uh, and that we're very clear and coherent in managing those um, going forward. Because failure to do this and notify regulators is now going to be a very clear compliance risk issue. Um, uh, which potentially exposes the organization to investigations and fines. Uh, and that is new. That is not something we've seen uh, under the current regime. Uh, and the final thing I was just going to mention is uh, individual rights. I've kind of touched on this at the beginning, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, but the individual is given these new rights to, on a statutory basis, to have much greater uh, control over the data that sits within the data controller um, organization. So some of these rights are well understood under the current regime, like a right to access information. So I can write in to my employer and say, provide me with access to all the information you hold about me. And with certain conditions attached, they have to respond back to that and give access to that information. Um, but there are new rights that are created. So rights to require uh, the data to be ported from one um, organization to another. Uh, and this is not in every case, but there are constraints and controls around this. Uh, but the, 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 the rationale for this one is, Maybe I create a social media portfolio profile with one social media environment and I want to move to another. Um, but the biggest barrier to moving might be the fact that I can't actually transfer my data. Uh, so this creates a statutory right to do that. Um, but of course, it would also apply to banks, to mobile phone uh, service providers and so on. Um, the right to uh, the other one that's often uh, kind of caught on is, is the right to be forgotten or the right to erasure. So this is the right for someone to come in and say, I would like my records to be deleted because I don't think they're relevant anymore. I don't think you need them uh, and I'd like you to get rid of them. Now, again, as, as I've just described that, you'll see it's not an absolute right. It's a right that's qualified. So it only applies to the extent that there's no overriding reason to retain the data or a legal requirement to keep the data. Uh, but it is um, a quite widely publicized right. Uh, and there are other ones dealing with automated decision making, uh, to have your records corrected if the mistakes are on them, uh, to object to direct marketing uh, and other kind of profiling related activities. So these are all available to people and you've got an obligation to tell people that they have these rights. And if they uh, request that they get exercised, you've got to, to, to deal with them uh, pretty quickly. So you've got 30 days to respond to the rights uh, that are exercised and to do that um, without trying to create any barriers to, to entry, like charging a fee or uh, or saying you need to provide lots of extra information. So uh, the, 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 there's a movement here to saying we're going to enhance these rights and actually make it easier for people to access. And as a responsible controller and to some extent a processor, you need to be aware of them because if they are excised, you need to be able to have processes in place to, to address them. Because again, if you don't respond effectively, if you miss the timescales, if you give the wrong information or you refuse to to hand over the information or, or exercise the rights that are requested, that's a clear infringement and uh, you have the exposure of, of, again, enforcement and fines. So to wrap everything together, I thought it's helpful in this final slide just to give a little bit of a flavour of how we see organisations effectively managing compliance risk across the entirety of the, 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 the privacy landscape we've been talking about. 
Uh, and the best way to do that is to really see privacy as something which sits throughout the, the seams of the veins, if you like, of the organization. It's not just something for one department, the IT team, the legal team, the compliance team. It's really something for everyone. Uh, and th the way that that then translates itself it, it, it effectively is to say, organizationally, we have a commitment to compliance to privacy standards. And that really sits at an ethical level or a sort of standards level, uh, which we often see in sort of overarching privacy principles that senior leadership might come out and say, we stand behind as an organization. Uh, and then underneath that, that, that we find that that translates or should translate into a set of clear privacy policies uh, that set out in a little bit more detail uh, what we mean by uh, privacy and the importance of privacy for the organization. So keeping data secure, uh, only telling people, only using data for purposes for which we've told them we're going to collect it and fairly use it uh, and keeping it um, uh, for periods of time which are appropriate. Uh, and then dropping that down another level into clear procedures, procedures which people can understand on a day-to-day -day level in the way that they operate, covering a lot of the issues we've talked about today in terms of uh, how to go about collecting consent, how do they go about managing data transfers, how should they go about responding to subject access uh, and other rights that people uh, may come in and ask to, uh, to, to, to invoke, uh, retention policies, training uh, manuals and so on, all of which will help them understand on a day-to-day -day level how they should respond to and, and handle data effectively. Uh, and for the really mature organizations, they, they start with a set of clear controls around those areas, and then they take them to the business. They take them to the stakeholders across HR, uh, IT, uh, and the sales side of things, uh, operations, and say, look, these are the procedures and the controls that we want to see adopted. How do you and how are you going to apply this to the way that you handle data within your side of the business and get them to engage uh, and, and, and take those things forward. So that's the really mature organization is taking those documents and turning to real hard operating procedures aligned to the way that data is being used. Um, and then, uh, then let's not forget that having a good set of controls and having that operationalized is not the end of the story. Uh, you need resources and help to do that. So having a good, strong data protection team is gonna be important, potentially with the data protection officer, having training modules in place to make sure people understand what they need to do, guidance notes, manuals, um, audits to check on how progress is being made. Uh, they may be soft or hard audits um, and feeding that back into the loop of improvement throughout the organization. These are all really important things to do to make sure that what we're doing is fit for purpose and that we're always uh, improving the way we operate. And, and I think the final thing to mention is that none of this is static. You know, the, the law here is not static. The regulatory environment is constantly evolving. Um, the regulations in Europe are still not finalized. So, you know, we'll see more change just in Europe over the next few years. Uh, but also we're going to see other countries following the European model. We've seen a lot of that already, uh, but uh, over the years to come, we're going to see more and more countries uh, following the lead. They may take their own di directions, but this kind of idea of uh, regulating the way in which data is being used is, is clearly not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, and so it's important to really to be um, aware of uh, what those developments are and to be able to feed it back into the way that the organization operates. And if you've built the uh, the compliance framework for the business along the lines that we've articulated here with building blocks and principles underlying all of it, uh, but the actual detail being something that can be evolved and developed over time, whether it's on a regional basis or a business basis, uh, then you'll be in a strong position to achieve an effective level of compliance. And, and with that, really, I just wanted to, to, to finish uh, the session today to thank you for your attention. I hope you found it a valuable introduction to the GDPR. Uh, but also an insight into how privacy risk can be managed effectively for the organization going forwards. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew, for a great presentation. So what have we at Payoneer done in order to be ready for GDPR? At Payoneer, we take pride in providing a high level of security and transparency with respect to how we collect, use, and share the personal data of our customers, partners, and vendors. We have diligently prepared for GDPR, consulting as we always do with the leading experts. We have, uh, we have updated our policies and refreshed our procedures pertaining to data subjects access and their other rights, and have taken these and other measures to be fully compliant with GDPR. We hope you are too. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to your primary contact at Payoneer, who will be happy to guide you. If you haven't been in touch with us before, please head to payoneer.com slash mass payouts, and you can contact us there. Thank you and have a great day.